you can almost say, well, it's four chapters. We're in the final quarter. We're in the last little bit of this book. And um, we know that, as we've been saying, that Paul wrote that to the Philippian church, the church at Philippi. And all through this letter that Paul has written to um, this church here, we see that these Christians, this church there, are um, his pride and joy. They're, they're the church that he really is so happy with, you know. We know his situation. He's a prisoner and he's waiting for his hearing. Um, oh, my! have I gone off, Patty? Are you all right? She is. Well. Patty, have I gone off? It's okay. They soon was a problem, but in the recorder it was okay. But you are in Zoom yeah. still? Yeah, under life. Yeah, under life. Yeah. Um, yeah, we just got a problem at the moment with some of the. Yeah. Because we, we're doing both, we're doing them um, live stream, we're doing Zoom, and the Zoom has just gone off. So, <laughs> so what can I do here? Yeah, we've just got to wait for that. Sorry about this. We've just got to wait for the Zoom because we've got people trying to follow there as well. Yeah. Is it okay then now? Yeah, mate. Can you turn on the data? No, huh? oh, because the, uh, the this is port. Oh, is it? So, yeah. Uh, ah. Sometimes uh, it doesn't uh, crash. You know, like I see. No, we've lost the connection. Yeah. Could be. Yeah. If we're in the life, let's just pull up the table a little bit. Yes. Which it has. Yeah. Maybe if it's too long, we might put the live stream out. I don't know. Maybe yeah. we should have to do the Zoom one then. All right, are we back on pay? Everything's okay, all right, sorry about that. I don't know what happened, we lost the connection, I think. Okay, well, Sam, we're, um, we've been going through um, this uh, book of, uh, to the Philippian church and we've um, you know, been thinking that Paul, and Paul's been explaining that the church there is pride and joy. And we know his situation, as I was saying, he's waiting for his hearing before Caesar. And, uh, you know, it, it's a grim situation, but as he writes this, letter here he, he's really basically saying to the Philippian church that they're his pride and joy and the words he used here he he's really talking about here he says here look in verse one therefore my beloved and long for brethren my joy my crown so stand fast uh, in the Lord beloved it, when he talks about crown he's talking about the, it's the same Greek word that they used when they made that sort of Le uh, crown of leaves to put on the head of a an athlete who'd run a race in the Greek uh, Greek um, sports arena, um, the Greek uh, games, and he's sort of saying, "You are like my 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 crown that I would receive for running the race. You're the result of of all my effort. You're the crown and glory of all my effort." But there was a problem. There was a problem in the church at um, Philippi, and um, he does have to address that. But in the first four verses here which really I want to look at he uses um, this word these words in the Lord he uses that three times in the first verse where Paul urges the believers he says here I want you to stand fast in the Lord beloved that's what he's saying to him. I want you to stand fast and um, as a soldier went into battle he would be expected to stand fast in, in defiance of the enemy you know when the enemy attacked when things were getting difficult in the heat of the battle if he lost his courage and run then everything would be lost all around him he would be he would be supporting his fellow soldiers and, and if they all took flight then the battle's lost and so Paul is urging Christians he's urging these people in Philippi to stand firm to stand first now the world is full of bright lights and attractions and he's really saying what I want you to do is stand firm and to resist them 
And the only way we can do that with, as Christians is with the help and the power of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, because we can't do it on our own. If we try and do it in our own strength, then we fail. Because we have to remember this, that you know, the seductions, the temptations of this world, you know, they're just too strong for us. We can't always fight them off. Um, you know, and um, the, the, the powers of this world, that are operating in this world, they, they can overcome us. But we need to overcome these in times of weakness through the power of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. We know, we all know, I should, I'm sure we're all sure of the fact that there's both people and there's places that we can go and people we can be with that make it quite difficult to stand in difficult times. You know, it, and vice versa. There's places we can be at and people we can be with who help us to stand in difficult times. They help to keep us strong when we're up against it. I'm sure we can look back to some of the, um, maybe the worst moments of our life when we've really done things that are wrong, maybe things we're ashamed of. And uh, we could probably say that things might have been better if at that time I was with, a, with better company, with somebody who would have said, hey, that's not the right thing to be doing. Are you sure about this? Do you think you should be somewhere else? Mm -hmm. uh, and so better company, better places can have a big effect on us, right? But ultimately, the Bible tells us that our safest company is with the Lord. We resist and we re resist the things that of this world that would not be stand by being in the company of our Lord, by keeping our eyes on him. The problem Paul has to deal with is in verse 2. There's a problem in the church in verse 2 because he said, I urge you also, true companion, help these women who laboured with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers whose name are in the book of life. Verse 3. But, and he says there in verse 2, I implore Judea and I implore Syncate to be of the same mind in the Lord. So there's two ladies there who... Um, uh, who are in the church where things don't seem to be too smooth between them. Now, I'm sure if you've been attending church for several years, uh, like me, and I'm sure you must have come to us, you know how easy it is for these, this sort of situation to arise, for squabbles and um, disunity to happen. We don't know exactly what the problem was here. We don't exactly know what they fell out about. But we know it can be the flowers, it can be the carpet or the colour of the paint on the wall, it can be the hymns or the hymn book or what version of the Bible you're going to read from. And it's, you know, it's endless. We know the squabbles that can come along and I've seen several of them and I'm sure you probably have as well. But Paul says to the church there, to the people, that I beg you, he says, to, to stop this, to try to get these people to agree. And that's one of the things, you know, that we have to be careful of the church. These, these sort of squabbles in church are just not right, you know. This is, these, these two ladies are sisters in the Lord. They're, they're, they're meant to be, you know, sisters. They're meant to be, you know, joint companions. They are joint workers. Put Jesus first. Don't put your own point of view first. And it's really sad when you look at this, that the only things we know about these two ladies that is recorded in the Bible forever is that they quarrel together. It's a rather terrible record to have, isn't it, that these two ladies quarrelled together. And um, we don't know if that was resolved or not. We have to hope that it was. But he says in verse 3, Look, I urge you also, true companions, help these women who laboured with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. We know that these ladies have worked together with Paul. And with Clement, they'd all work together. They'd all work side by side, labouring along in the work that had to be done uh, in the church of Philippi for the gospel. They'd all been there. And he says, look, they're your sisters. They really are your sisters. They're not just some strangers, but they're sisters. Just like you, and just like us as well, but just like he's saying just to the church in Philippi, just like you, their names are in the book of life. And you know, when Jesus spoke to his disciples and they were talking about all the things that are important, he said, just rejoice that your name's in the book of life. Because if your name's not in the book of life, if it's not registered there, then you're in the book of death, aren't you? So he said, but these, these ladies, although they're squabbling, their names are in the book of life. And, you know, and it's not just when there's squabbles going on. You know, that's not the only time we should be helping and that we should be there for one another. You know, we're encouraged to be there for one another all the time to bear one another up in prayer, to have one another in our thoughts, to have a concern for each other, all the members of the church. Because we know for a while, if one part of the body suffers, then the whole body suffers. So Paul's saying, you know, 
try to build these layers up, try to stop the, the squabble going on. And then we get to verse 4, and I suppose it's one of the most well-known verses in the Bible. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. You know, there's a, a chorus, a hymn with that, isn't there? You know, most of us have sung the words, and we've sung them so often that we know them. But we know it's not always that easy. It's not always easy to rejoice when things are difficult. Sometimes we, we start to feel a bit sorry for ourselves. Poor old me, why is this happening to me? Why am I going through this? Where is the Lord in all of this situation, you know? And that's where those words in verse 1 come, to, come into being, where he says, stand fast in the Lord, to be strong when things are difficult. You know, we, you know, we need to understand that um, it's not always plain sailing, you know. We need to realise that joy actually has nothing to do with um, how rich we are or how wealthy we are. Joy is not found in what we possess, but living, you know, it's not, found in, it's not found in living in the right place, in the right house, should I say. It's not found in having exactly the right joy. All these things help. But, you know, we know people who've made it to the top. They have absolutely everything in life you could imagine. You know, we, you could look at them and you could probably be envious. They've got everything they want in life. But they're far from content. They're far from happy. You know, and some of them, I often think of that, is it Robin Williams, is it? Or, or the, the comedian who at the height of everything committed suicide. You just can't get your head around it. And yet at the same time, we, we come across people who've had a, a real, real bad, they've been dealt a real bad hand in life. You know, the, the cards that have come to them are really bad and they have very little. Uh, and they're probably, you know, living in poverty, but poverty, you know, but at the same time as they live in this lack of everything, they still have a real joy in their life and a real joy in their hearts, you know. So you can have very little and you could be joyful. You can have everything and not be joyful. But, but Paul is saying, rejoice in the Lord always. Now, you know, whatever situation you find yourself in. And I suppose we've all heard of Captain Scott. I was reading about Captain Scott of, of the Antarctic. We know how he went to the Antarctic and he never came back. He lost his life in that frozen wasteland up, uh, down there. But before he died, he wrote a letter to his friend, J.M. Barry. And the thing, you know, this is what he wrote. Things were very bad, you know, but we know that he, he lost his life there. This is what he wrote. He says, we are pegging out in a very com comfortless spot. We're in a desperate state, feet frozen, no fuel, and a long way from food. But it would do your heart good to be in our tent, to hear our songs and our cheery conversation. Because you see, the secret is this. Happiness depends not on things, not on places, but it depends on people, really or persons, and it depends on companionship. And if we're with the right person, got the right companion, then everything falls into place, nothing else matters. And as believers, for us to be in the right place with the right company, the right person, we have to be with the Lord Jesus Christ, because that's what we're able to do all the way through the Bible. And the best thing about it is that we're told in the Bible that nothing can separate us from the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, nothing can take his presence away from us. You know, so if nothing can take his presence away from us, nothing can take that joy away from us. That's really what Paul is saying. So Paul sets out those, he sets out that as one mark, and he sets out a second mark of a Christian. The first one is joy, but he also says in verse 5, he says, Let your gentleness, gentleness be known to all men, because the Lord is at hand. Or, you know, he, he's really talking about moderation. Let the way you live your lives be visible and let it be known to all men. You know, what is he really talking about? He's talking about, you know, um, things that are, he's, he's saying, look, I've, I've thought about, he says, I've thought about things, I've experienced so many things. I know what I'm talking about when I say this to you. And, I, you know, so he says, there, like in the end of verse four, let me just say it again, so I've got a bit from myself. But he, he says, I'm talking about rejoice. He says, I know what I'm talking about. I've been in this situation. I know how bad things can get. I know what the world can chat about you. I'm here in prison in chains waiting for my trial. But he says, I'm saying to you rejoice. And I want to reinforce that. And again, I say rejoice. Make sure that you don't forget what you're called to, who your friend is, who your companion is, the Lord Jesus Christ. But then in verse five, he says, so let, your, um, let your gentleness or your moderation be known to all men because the Lord is at hand. Now, what he's talking about is your gentleness, your moderation. He's really talking about your sense of fairness and your sense of justice, how you view things, how you view situations. Not 
gentleness or moderation in the way you behave as a what you eat, what you drink or anything like that, although they, that does matter, that, that's the way we control ourselves and that, but, but he's saying having the right way of dealing with other people, um, you know, what people see, how people see you live your life as another human being, your responsibility to them. And, you know, I was talking to Anne the other day, there's things I'd like to do to a certain person if I had half a, a yard to do it, but you can't because that's not the way we're supposed to behave. But, you know, we know what the, what in our in our hearts and our minds what we'd like to do, but it's not the behaving of somebody who's supposedly been born again and you're trying to follow what the Lord Jesus Christ has asked us to do. Because why why because the Lord is at hand? Because ultimately, God is going to be the judge. God is going to be the one who deals with these situations. People may think they get away with have got away with everything, but one day they're going to have to stand in front of him. We can look at someone like Jimmy Savile and say, well, he got away with it. He lived a complete and full life despite all the terrible things he did, but he's got away with it. But no, that's not true. He's going to stand before God. And, you know, we have to realise that vengeance belongs to God. God's going to deal with it. And so he says there in verse 6, be anxious for nothing. Don't get wound up. Don't get frustrated with what's going on in your life. You know, don't think, oh, this is not the right thing or the, or the right, right way for things to be working out and then get yourself stressed out about it, right? But take it to God in prayer. Pray about it. Ask him for peace about it. In, in all things, you know, and, and then be full of thanksgiving because you know that God has heard you. Have that peace. Have that joy in your heart because you know God has heard your prayers and, and you've, you've made it known to him. And then he says in verse 7, and the peace of God which passes all or surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. If in the middle of all the stresses and strains that we face about whether things are working out right or what's happening to us, what we're up against or what we see our friends up against and the situations they face as well, and all the things we'd like to do in, the, in, in our normal human sort of natural way of wreaking vengeance or getting our own way of you know, taking out our anger on somebody else, if we take it to God, ask him to be the one who deals with it, then he'll give us the peace to know that he will. Because it says there in um, uh, verse uh, five, the Lord is at hand. He's here and he's going to deal with the situation and he'll give you the peace in your heart and in your mind that he's going to do do, that, do just that. Although sometimes, you know, we really do feel, where is God in the middle of all of this? What is the Lord doing in the middle of all of this? Doesn't he see my situation? And it reminds you of when, the, the disciples were on the, lo on the lake in the boat when things were going wrong and they must have felt, where is the Lord in all this? Don't you care, Master, that we're about to drown? But we have to realise that he is in control. That he does know what's happening. And if we take our worries, our concerns to him, make our requests known to God, let your requests be made known to God, he will give you his peace, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and mind through Christ Jesus. And so I know we've been up, you know, as a church, we watch poor, you know, a couple of our poor old members go through the meal and we are full of what's going on, what's really happening. And we get frustrated and we get upset. But we have to realise that even there, God will deal with that situation and believe and trust that things will work out for the best and will work out right. Maybe we'll be able to look back in two or three years time and we'll just be able to see exactly what God has done so often I've been in situations you think where is God in this but you look back in a couple of years time and you see you've been read, led down the right path and you've gone and made the right choices and things have worked out for the best because we don't see the full picture so just read those little verses through and uh, you could probably get a little bit more out of it than I've just put in there but that's just uh, I don't want to go on too many verses but just those seven verses I think for the way I've been feeling over the last few days about certain situations that calm me down a little bit anyhow. And I hope that will do the same for you as well. So I'll end there. We'll have a little prayer and then um, hopefully see some of you on Sunday morning down the chapel. Um, be good to see some then. The rest of you join us online as well. So let's have a little prayer and then we'll say, have a little chat and then we can say, God bless. But let's have a little talk at the end. And Lord, we just thank you for your word. And um, we know in our natural way that we would like to work things out to probably not the right way. We would maybe end up resorting to saying or doing the wrong things, taking the wrong action. But we've told here, if we bring our thoughts and prayers to you, Lord, that you'll deal with it. Ultimately, you will deal with it. We see that all through the Bible, how you've dealt with situations and you've brought people through and help us to have the faith 
to believe that you will work things out for us if we belong to you. So thank you for these verses. Thank you for this little portion here that we can learn so much from. In Jesus' name, amen. Can you unmute us all, Patty, so we can have a little chat? <laughs>